Hey everyone, let's talk a little bit about historical and cultural studies and the criticism of Marxism. Let me adjust my mic right here. All right, let's hope that's better. So I'm going to give you an overview of these three. I put them together in one lecture because they all are all so closely related. Historical scholars generally look at literature in terms of what historical events have uh, are occurring in the author's lifetime and in the lifetime of the characters um, to address some some questions that we'll look at. Cultural studies is closely related, um, an offshoot of historical criticism, where we're looking at groups of people. We're studying group, different groups of people within a work of literature. So maybe a group uh, based on ethnicity or a group based on um, oh, what part of town they live in or a group based on their uh, economic status, that sort of thing. So looking at groups. Historical looking at events, cultural looking at groups. Marxism looks at interactions between characters based on economic status. So you can see how these all sort of interrelate. So historical studies, sometimes called new criticism, um, is really more of a reflection of a writer's attitude towards a particular time period about which he or she is writing. The argument is that um, a reader cannot understand um, a work of literature unless the reader understands the historical context of the character's lives. And you need to understand the writer's attitude towards that time period because as um, what, what the critics argue is impossible to do is for art authors to write about a different time period than their own without exhibiting some of their own prejudices and biases about people in that time period. So those two things together make up the thrust of new historicism. So this theory was sort of born um, in the days of, of the Vietnam uh, War. So in World War II, for example, when the soldiers came home, they were celebrated as being heroes because the war uh, had made sense. It was very clear who the enemy was. It was very clear what we needed to do. And we knew when we were finished and we saw those men as being heroes. When men came home from the Vietnam War, they were not celebrated. The war had been unpopular in the United States. There were a lot of protests about the Vietnam War. Uh, people felt like we had no business being there. Um, it, the enemy wasn't as clear cut. What we were doing there wasn't as clear cut. And it certainly wasn't clear cut as to when it was finished. So this was sort of the first time we had looked at historical events in terms of war as um, something other than patriotic. So the way history was being written had to change a little bit. Usually history is written from the point of view of the victors. And it shows all of the, the, the battles, the engagements, the, the, the generals and all in a very positive patriotic light. Whereas the people on the other side, the losers, are shown very negatively. And that changed uh, around this time period. And the way people were writing about um, hist historical events changed as well. So um, some of the things that we're interested in when we apply um, a historical lens to a work of literature is the, the, um, the attitude of the author that we could see in the characters. Basically what we're asking ourselves as well is how, how, is the, how are the characters depicted? So in other words, characters have motivations to do what they do, right? Any character in a, in a work of fiction is going to do something for a particular reason. If we look at a story and the characters from a historical perspective, we're asking, what are the constraints on their actions? In other words, is the character acting the only way that character could act in that time period? 
So could Phoenix Jackson have done things differently? Did she have that ability? We talked about um, Louise Mallard in Kate Chopin's Story of an Hour and said she cannot leave her husband even if she wants to because um, of economic factors. She doesn't have the money to go anywhere. So there are particular historical things that go on that put constraints on the characters. All right. How does the author deal with those constraints? So one of the things we're going to talk about that leads really on to cultural um, studies is how does the work consider traditionally marginalized population? Marginalization is when we have groups of people to whom we don't listen. We push them aside and say their views aren't important. They as groups are not important. We don't need to know their history. Who cares? So what we want to see is, and, and you've already played with this a little bit, is how does, um, for, for instance, um, Eudora Welty, how does she portray uh, the African-American character of um, Phoenix Jackson? Does she um, uh, enforce stereotypes that are already in place, or does she try to make a character that destroys those stereotypes? So those are the kind of questions we'll consider in um, cultural studies. So most important is, is this idea of um, looking at the marginalization and powerlessness of non-white groups. So what, who are these characters that don't normally get featured? Do we have um, people who are being brought to the center and their stories are being told? Or does the author continue to marginalize them? Who are these groups? What do we know about them? What stereotypes are, are being constituted? What do we even consider a culture, right? Is it just based on race or nat nationality? Um, could it have to do with sexuality? What, what all do we mean when we mean cultures? So you can see that these two are closely related. Historical studies and cultural studies are, are very difficult to tease apart. But think more in terms of historical studies looking at history and events and cultural studies looking at groups of people. The third um, idea is that of Marxist criticism where we're looking at economic struggles as, exp as they are expressed in literature. So they're interested in, let me skip to the last slide first and then I'll go back, um, questions about who has the economic power in the story? Why do they have that power? How did they get that power in the first place? How do they maintain it? So some things you could talk about is the social class of the author. Is it the same as the class of um, the characters about whom she's writing? Um, how do the characters of different classes interact? Is there a conflict between them? And um, I was thinking again about uh, Kate Chopin's Mrs. Mallard, why she didn't leave her husband. And from a historical perspective, we know that um, the Napoleonic Code, that was the law code in effect in Louisiana at the time, and that's where the story, story of an hour takes place, um, dictated that any property or wealth that a woman brought into a marriage, for example, was then um, sort of made over to the husband. He could do with that property whatever he wished. And if for some reason they divorced, that property that the woman brought into the marriage remained with the husband. So based on, on that, we can see, whoops, sorry. Um, how is the power maintained? Obviously, men in this scenario have the power, and they're able to maintain that because of a particular law that's in place to keep the wife subordinate in terms of money. So these are the kind of questions that, that are asked. They're all about class and economics. So any of these three, historical, cultural, Marxism, all have to do with areas of society and how they appear in literature. They just all go about it a little differently. Historical events or what kind of things happen in a time period, cultural studies looking at groups of people, and Marxism looking at economic power struggles.